chapter 6. Um, we spent some time going over those things that we're not supposed to do. And I want to say this again simply because I feel compelled to do so. When I say that what we do doesn't affect our salvation, that is all I am referring to. <laughs> I don't believe that because we're out from under the law in regards to our salvation that we can live however we want to live and do anything we want to do and uh, sin all we want to sin. I, I'm not ever going to promote that idea because it's not biblical. Last week we looked at chapter 5 and some of the things that we're told not to do. How can you justify having things that we're not supposed to do and then say that it's okay to do them because we're out from under the law? That's, that's stupid. All I have ever said to that regard is that if we sin our salvation is not affected by that sin that's it our life our interpersonal relationships our open communication with the father all of that is affected but our salvation is absolutely sure <laughs> I mean, you, you can't you would have to really read into Scripture to find a way to explain that any other way. I mean, you just can't do it. This is something that I am very adamant about and have been called this last week over um, a number of times and been called lawless because I don't believe the law saves you. I said that I you know, believe you can just go out and live however you want to live. No, I don't. No, I don't. Galatians 5 talks clearly about the things that we're not supposed to do. I don't want to read over them again. Galatians 5 also talks about the things that the Holy Spirit does in us. And those I kind of do want to go over just briefly in preparation for Galatians chapter 6. Verse 22 of Galatians 5 says, For, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Why? Because they are of the Spirit. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Just don't do those things. Okay, those are what the Holy Spirit develops in our life. Just like on a on a fruit tree, you get fruit from that tree that's consistent with that tree. In the same way, when the Holy Spirit's fruit begins to grow in you, it's consistent with the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's just that's how it is. We, we may not understand it. We may not like that idea. I don't know. I would challenge you to find a better way. Uh, but we do fight against it for whatever reason. Well, that being said, it leads into chapter 6. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are... Re you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. What basically is that telling us there? That we're going to sin. If we sin, the ones that are 
not sinning should or are those that are right with God those that are strong in the faith should strive to restore that person now how is a person restored to um, normal Christian life we'll put it that way um, it's not that their salvation is restored here that's I, I've heard that used and it's not what it's talking about it has nothing to do with our salvation that's in the first four and a half well first yeah probably four and a half chapters of this book this is a person who's saved okay. what is the restoration if a person sees somebody else sinning in reality it's other believers job to confront that person now I know there's going to be people who say well you can't do that because that is judging somebody what says you can't do that because it's judging somebody there's nothing wrong with that and then they're going to automatically turn back to the verse that says judge not lest ye be judged great and for the judgment they, they leave this part out the judgment with which you judge you will be judged uh, I want people to judge me I want other believers to look at my life and say hey I see a problem with this person's life and to call me on it so that I can be closer to God because when I'm living my life I don't look at it and see sin I may be self-justifying it's very possible to be self-justifying Lest, judge not lest you be judged well go ahead judge me but I'll do the same for you so that we can both walk closer to almighty God we can both have better interpersonal relationships with both saved and lost we can both have that father son relationship between God and men that would be tarnished had we not been judged because I may well not see a point in which I am sinning and it could be something so minuscule as an attitude where I may be being abrasive you know, that's a horrible thing but I would look at it myself. I'm just using this by way of example. I'm looking at it myself as, uh, well, I deserve it because look how he or she is treating me. So I can treat them that way right back. And somebody else might step in and say, no, that's a sin. Make it right. And then it's my duty to confess that sin to be cleansed from that sin and to repent of that sin then I am right with God and I would hope that there would be somebody who would tell me thankfully I've got parents who care and I've got a wife who cares I've got friends who care and I would hope that I would care enough about you to do the same for you. If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are, re are spiritual, restore such a one. But here's the catch to it, in a spirit of gentleness. Now what does that automatically tell you coming off of Galatians chapter 5? That it's to be done walking in the spirit. You don't see gentleness as one of the uh, points in which man sins. 
in verses 17 and uh, through 21. But in the fruit of the Spirit, you see gentleness. In a spirit of gentleness, we're to restore. Walking in the Spirit and doing it right. Considering ourselves, he says yourself, so that we aren't tempted to do the same things that somebody else is doing that we're going after. Well, if you do that, you're a hypocrite. Well, call it what you want. Call it what you want. If you do that, you're sinning. <laughs> no, that's, that's the easy way to put it. You know, people get too caught up on what they think somebody else should do. Whether it's calling somebody a hypocrite because they call themselves a Christian and they do this or whatever, which in a lot of cases I'm going to say is probably quite accurate to call them that. Uh, but the problem comes in that people get too concerned over somebody else and not concerned over their own their own spiritual walk. What are we talking about here? Dealing with somebody else, but that's not all that wrote that Galatians chapter six talks about. Not at all. Verse two says, "Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ." What is the law of Christ? I've been told emphatically that it's the Ten Commandments. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. The law of Christ is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. That is the law of Christ. It's plain and simple. That, those, those two laws fulfill all the law that God has ever laid down. You can't get more explicit than that. Now, if I love you the way I love myself and want myself to be right with God, should I not want the same for you? Now, I've heard over and over and over people talking about this idea and they've used the ideas of, well, you feed yourself. You clothe yourself. You make sure that you have shelter. No, that's not what it's talking about at all. That's the most trivial, minuscule thing that you'll ever find. But if I want me to have a right relationship with God, and I don't want you to have that right relationship with God then I'm not loving you the way I love myself that's what it's talking about it's, it has nothing to do with giving oneself food or clothes or anything else it's dealing with the spiritual and it says right here to Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, should I concern over other people's physical well-being? You bet. Nothing wrong with that. But that's not what it's referring to here. Not at all. It's it, He doesn't go through talking about all the... the disadvantages of the law and of circumcision and then tell you how to live as a Christian and then throw in a side thought of well you know you, you really ought to feed people too <laughs> like you feed yourself no when you fulfill the law of Christ it has to do with, with spiritual things I care enough about me to want a right relationship with God. I better care that way about you. And if I'm doing so, 
if I see you engaging in sin, it is my obligation both to you and to Almighty God to say something. And it's your obligation if you see me falling into some kind of sin to point it out. Let's get this straightened out. Otherwise, I dare say, you don't love the way God loves. If I don't do it, I don't love the way God loves. And I'm not fulfilling the law of Christ. I'm, I'm just not doing it. Or you're not doing it. If we don't do that, we're not doing it. And it doesn't, I don't care how many times you bring it back to judge not, lest you be judged. I want people to judge me in that fashion. What you're doing is wrong. Deal with it. I welcome that. Because I don't want to be wrong. I want to be right with Christ. Now here's the catch. If I'm going to fulfill the law of Christ, I better care that same way about you. Verse 3 is another one that's been used, misused more often than not. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he dece deceives himself. He deceives himself. Well, you say you're not, you're all that, and you're not all that. You know, well, who are you really lying to? Your own self. You know, it's not one that I can utilize to point to somebody else and say, well, you say you're a Christian, but... You know, that's where people misuse it all the time. And it's not right to do that. It is wrong to do that. But what is he talking about here? If anyone thinks of himself thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Now, what was, well, I, I hate to call it the original sin because I'm not sure that that's a biblical thought, but pride is one of the greatest sins that a person can have. You know, and boy, I'll tell you what, None of us have the right to be proud of ourselves. You know, I was thinking about this this last week, and I find it very, very important that Paul said, I will not boast in anything except the cross of Christ. <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's in verse 14 of this particular chapter. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. That's what matters. You know, I, we shouldn't boast in ourselves. Our pride should not be, I am or I this, or I anything, but Christ. If we have anything of which to boast, it's Christ, and that's it. He says in verse 4, But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his uh, his own load. Well, what is that talking about when it just um, talked to me in verse 2 about bearing one another's burden? What, what, what would that be talking about? Do your own job before God. Carry that burden that you got to do for God. Don't concern that way over somebody else. Now, somebody might um, look at a pastor and say, boy, I wish I was the pastor. You know, we've, we've had that situation here in our church before. Somebody trying to get 
the pastor thrown out so that he could be the pastor. Didn't work uh, because that's not what God called him. You know, called of the church. I mean, it's just it, it wasn't right, and it, the people knew it, I believe. But they just were trying to um, carry somebody else's burden. They weren't the one called to be the pastor of this church. The one that was the pastor was the pastor of this church. Trying to carry somebody else's burden instead of his own. What was what should his own burden have been? Whatever God called him to. I don't know whatever happened to the guy. Dad probably does, but I don't. I don't care. It's irrelevant. But this I say: if I try to carry somebody else's burden, then I am not doing what God called me to do. And if you try to carry my burden, you're not doing what God called you to do. You're trying to do what I'm called to do, and that's not going to work. Do what God calls you to do. Be the person God called you to be. You're saved. Act like it. Don't uh, think, let's see, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Don't be what somebody else is. Be who you are. That's really what it's talking about here. Be who you are before God. That's all he will ever ask of you. Most people on this planet know of Billy Graham. Okay. When he gets when, when he stands before God if he hears well done it'll be because he did what God called him to do a lot of people have heard of many of the TV radio pastors that are good and if they hear well done it'll be because that's what God called them to do they did it. Most people probably haven't heard of, and I'm not even sure I can remember his name, the guy that used to walk down Indian Creek to clean the to clean the church. Yeah. Uh, most people have never heard of him. But guess what? He did what God called him to do. And he liked it. And if he hears well done, it's because he did that. He didn't strive to be Chuck Swindoll. He didn't strive to be Billy Graham. He didn't strive to be anybody but what God called him to do. Was it meaningless? Not at all. Because that's what God called him to do. Wasn't it Alice that used to come down and work every week at the church doing stuff that way too? You know, because she was called to do so. And I could go on with long lists of people who have gone to glory that have done, I believe, what God called them to do. Marguerite was another one. Spent years praying for the saints, those that are saved, for this church, for missionaries, for individuals within her fear of life because God called her to do that and allowed her to do it and she liked it. She did what God called her to do and she liked it. That's what it's talking about in this passage. Not that I should try to be somebody I'm not. Not that you should try to be somebody you're not. Be who God called you to be. And guess what? That'll be more than enough to hear well done. If you just do it, don't worry about other people doing theirs. Do yours. I say this to all y'all because if I stood here and talked to me about it, you'd think I was a nut. <laughs> it's something that we as people need to do if we are going to fulfill 
the law of Christ. Do what we're called to do. And then verse 6 kind of says something even more odd. Let him who is taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. Now I've heard that all the way from uh, money to food to all sorts of stuff. And that, again, that's not what it what it's talking about. Interact with each other over the word of God. It's that simple. I've got one person in particular that I call and talk with about this type of thing. One person. I don't know whatever will happen if that one person makes it to glory before I go. I'll have to find somebody new. Uh, but what a... I mean, that's... Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. <coughs> Is that talking about doing the work so that we can be saved? No, not at all. That's doing the work so somebody else can be saved. I don't have to reap everlasting life of myself. <laughs> if I'm saved, I'm saved, and it's not by my doing. But if somebody else is saved, it could be because I showed them Almighty God by life, by word, by doing certain things, by saying certain things at certain times, whatever. That's what it's referring to here. If I do things on my own to make myself look better, it's never going to have any, any fruit. It'll be corruptible. If you don't believe it, go try to talk to somebody about Jesus and don't go through Jesus to do it. I've done it. It'll make you fall flat on your face, and I'll guarantee it. But when God moves and tells you, talk to this person, and you do it, great things can happen. And it they do happen. He says, let us not... Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And again, those that believe that you got to keep the law believe that doing good is that. No. The doing good that is being referred to here is doing what God calls you to do. I don't care who you are, what you've been called to, do it. Just do it. It's not going to be that hard. You know, there was a concept going around. Missionaries were talking about it for a long time. And I've mentioned this before here in Sunday school, but that, uh, well, God called me to, you know, someplace. And I didn't want to go there. I wanted to go to blah, 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 you know, wherever. But once I got there, I found out it wasn't that bad, and I kind of like it now. No. God says that he'll give you the desires of your heart when you trust in him wholeheartedly. It'll be something you want to do. Absolutely. You know, where, where is the disappointment if God is at work and we're following and doing that which we're called to do. Verse, verse 10 says, Therefore, 
as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. Okay, now if he had to bring out especially those that are of the household of faith, who is the all that's being referred to? Everybody. <laughs> Everybody. Well, what if they're mean to us? What if? What if they don't like us? Tough. What if they're hard to get along with? Tough. God doesn't segregate that way. You know, usually the reason why they're mean or the reason why they're hard to get along with or the reason why they're combative or, or uh, so ready to fight against somebody is because they're just not saved and they don't have the fruit of the Spirit growing in them. And if a person does, they see that and are jealous. <laughs> and that jealousy invokes all sorts of different problems. Uh, these are just things that happen. I'm verse 11. I'll read it just because it's in there. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. You know, why did he throw that in? I don't know. I'll be honest about it. I don't know. I don't care. It's not in, I mean, it, it, it almost seems out of context. Verse 12 says, as, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. What was this whole book about? Two promises that God made. One was the law. The other was circumcision. Conditional promises. Both were negated in a sense. God still wants us set apart and obedient, but not in the sense of making us right with God by doing it for our salvation. Okay? And here he's saying, as, uh, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. If I'm telling somebody a different gospel, I have nothing for which to worry. I can go out and talk about God all day long. I can go out and talk about works, salvation, getting to heaven by my works all day long, and I will never be persecuted. But bring up Christ died for my sins, died for your sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And you will suffer persecution. That right there is the reason why we hold it in. The reason why we hold it in. I don't want to be persecuted. Now, persecution can come in a number of different ways. Don't have time to talk about all of them, but you know, maybe it's something so simple as them thinking you're an idiot or don't believe you. Call you names. Maybe it's imminent death. Maybe it's being roughed up beyond what one should normally have happen to them physically. You know, we don't know what type of persecution, but that's what that's what it, it brings. They want to be able to boast. You know, I convinced them to trust their works. I, 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 you know, no. That's why he said, but God forbid that I should boast, except where? In the cross of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world was crucified to me, and I to the world. Only in him. Not in man, not in works, not in 
anything except for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. All else is futile. It says in verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but what does a new creation. How do we become a new creation? By the works of the law, by the works of the law shall no man be justified. By circumcision, circumcision avails nothing, and if it did, Christ's death is pointless. And that's a paraphrase of it, but that's right straight out of Scripture. That leaves us a couple minutes to do some considering. By what are you saved? By what are you saved? Think about it. The blood of Christ. Think of it for yourself. Put your name in there for me to say Jerry is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ not by works of righteousness which I have done but by his mercy he saved me so often I, I think we don't personalize this if I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ should I glory in my works no. I love being a Sunday school teacher. I don't, outside of when I was a pastor, I don't think there's something I like more. One day I'm not going to be one. Then what? <laughs> what if I can't for whatever reason? when the privilege of being a pastor was snatched from me. I, I was devastated. But God has opened up new doors. Okay? But shall I glory in that? I'm the Sunday school... No. There's people who are much better Sunday school teachers than me. As I was a pastor, there were people who were much better pastors than me. There are huge numbers of better orators than I am, some of them attending church here. <laughs> so There are many who can bring a point home much better than I can. So dare I boast in the fact that I'm a Sunday school teacher? What about you individually? What God has called you to do? Boast in that? I'll bet you if we went down the list we'd find people who are much better that had a whole lot more right to boast than y'all ever will. I have but one thing I can boast in, and that's that I'm saved and that God chose to work, to bring me to himself, the rotten sinner that I was, by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's all I can boast in, and that's all Paul was boasting in. Had he kept the law, think back the book of Galatians had he kept the law yes he was in the synagogues on the Sabbath he kept the Sabbath he did everything that the law said to do he was a Pharisee of Pharisees top-notch 
and God called him out of darkness into his glorious light by Paul's own words. The law didn't save him. Did he boast in that which he did? If he did, it would have been futile because it was worthless. Was he circumcised? Yeah. <laughs> didn't save him. Kept the law? Yeah. Didn't save him. But the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses all our sin was applied to his life and salvation was wrought in that giving the Holy Spirit who produced fruit in his life are we any different this is basic Christianity basic 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 now it's taken us well, I want to look because I'm not sure. We started Galatians uh, August 30th of last year. So August, September, October, November, December, and now we're into January just finishing up. That's five months <laughs> to get through this. And I thank you for coming along the whole way <laughs> it's been kind of slow at times but it's very important you know I'm afraid there are people who believe that they're saved because they came forward in a church service or they said the sinner's prayer or they did something to make themselves right with God. Kneeled by a bed and prayed. Did something. Oh, may it not be. Those are confirmations, great confirmations. But I don't have to say a sinner's prayer and know that I'm all these different things and go down the Romans road and all this other stuff to be saved. What I need to do to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And how do I do that? That's right there out of Acts 16. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I do that? Believe that there was a man named Jesus that lived on this earth? No. To believe that Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures and he was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures and then trust that wholly and as I trust it in its entirety put my faith exactly in that that when I stand before God and he, if he was to say why should I let you into heaven that that would be the only answer adequate I'm not talking against saying a sinner's prayer I'm not saying anything against the Romans road I'm not saying anything against uh, coming forward in a church service or anywhere that's not it at all but in order to be saved, I need not walk forward. I need not raise my hand and have the pastor pray for me. I, any of the things that man does, all they are is a confirmation. Now here's the catch. If I don't know, and we're going to get into this in Romans, uh, if I don't know that I'm a sinner, I don't know that I need salvation. If I don't no, it's because I haven't been told. And if I haven't been told, it's because somebody didn't tell me. And if I haven't been told, it doesn't make me any less responsible for my own activities. And I will pay the price if I haven't been told and I spend eternity in hell. 
because the wages of sin is death. No matter who's sinning, the wages of sin, the payment for sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now somebody might not know that. They may need somebody to show them from the scriptures what it really means to be saved. But when they put their trust solely in that, they're saved. That's it. Now a sinner's prayer, coming forward, raising your hand, whatever it might be, confirms that within the person and maybe shows it to the people around. But salvation comes not at the point of doing something, but at the point of my total reliance on the blood of Jesus Christ. And only in that. I hope that this book encourages each one of us. And though we've finished the book of Galatians now, Galatians 6 ends it, though we've finished that, don't set it aside and neglect it. Diana and I read through this just yesterday or the day before. How long did it take? Five minutes, maybe? Three, three minutes? Five, five, six, seven minutes? Wasn't very long. Just a few chapters. Six measly little chapters. It doesn't take very long. Read it. Read it in its context. We're walking away from it so we can study something else next week. But that doesn't mean that we have no need of the book of Galatians anymore. Let me ask you this as we close. Are we saved by keeping the law? the whole law or are we saved by separating ourselves unto God in their case with circumcision or is it through the gospel that Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures if it isn't the gospel that you're saved by you're not saved if it's the gospel plus anything, you're not saved. If it's anything besides solely the blood of Jesus Christ, you need to get off of it and come to Christ. Let his blood cleanse you from all sin. Let's close with prayer. Lord, thank you for your love, for dying for us, for caring for us so much that you came to earth so that we too can live. Thank you that all that you did freed us from the curse of the law and brought us to a point where we could be right with you just solely through your blood. Lord, help us to not sit on that and hold it, but to share it readily and happily with those to whom we have contact. We thank you for it in your name.